in this third and last video on the history of American housing and architecture, we'll focus more on the on the 20th century. Now, last uh, video, I was talking about how the Industrial Revolution really created a lot of slums and uh, crowded uh, housing and pollution, and this had spawned the City Beautiful movement during the Progressive Age at the turn of the 20th century. Well, kind of growing out of the Progressive Age was the spread of urban planning and the growth of the a whole new uh, profession, civil engineering. Civ civil engineering was a profession that uh, sort of planned the various urban systems together, whether it was water, sewage, electricity, mass transit, it would combine them and plan them for city growth together. And uh, one of the uh, earliest of these urban planners was Daniel Burnham, and he did a plan for Chicago that became famous in 1909. Burnham had been chief architect of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, and Chicago officials spent more than $300 million on his idea. And you can see in this picture here, he had uh, thought of having some green areas spread around the city and, and indeed along the riverfront for seeing uh, recreation along the riverfront. And you can see the sort of concentric roads that kind of uh, work together. All of this was uh, sort of the beginning of uh, uh, urban planning. Not surprisingly, part of this new urban planning were the first zoning laws. And uh, this was controversial because it meant that people would have restrictions on their private property, but you would have areas that would be zoned for retail and, and for uh, in industry and areas were zoned for single houses and apartment buildings. And it, it again was all sort of designed to uh, in, in mind of all the various urban systems that supported the housing. I should, of course, uh, state the obvious that in this period of the early 20th century, it was still Jim Crow, uh, which meant uh, racial segregation, and that covered housing. So if you were uh, African-American, you would end up living in an African-American area of the city, and that, of course, wasn't generally as nice. And uh, if you were, what people would do is, if they would sell their homes, they would agree not to sell them to people that were minorities. And so, you know, there, it's just say, if, even if there weren't official segregation laws like in the South, there was de facto segregation even in northern cities. Now, there really wasn't that much construction during World War I, but in the post-World War II era, the 1920s, the economy is going to explode. You tend to think of the 1920s, you think of the roaring 20s. And uh, the, uh, there's a lot of prosperity, the jazz age and so forth. And uh, during this period, more people bought cars. And this is going to profoundly affect, obviously, the way they build homes and how people live. And the most obvious way is people begin to have... Uh, in their new home construction in the suburbs, detached cars for garages. Now, there had been, uh, you know, carriage houses for horses, the wealthier that had them in back, and some people adapted those for car garages, but the, the general car to garage, detached garages were smaller in the 1920s, and they would shield the, the cars that were now ubiquitous. And of course, you know, there had been suburbs before. I've mentioned them in previous videos in the late 19th century with mass transit and everything going outside of the city. But with cars, the suburbs really go out further and there's a lot, there's just a boom of new construction. And uh, so all this new construction, they had various uh, architectural elements put in for the first time. For example, bay windows, windows that sort of extended outward. That was something that was indicative of the new 1920 suburban architecture. Also indicative of the 1920s suburban architecture were the new breakfast nooks, they call them, really built in as uh, just off the kitchen. It was an informal area to dine, not like a, a formal dining room, but which is off a different direction. In the 1920s with the automobile, you begin to see the first shopping centers springing up on the outside of cities. Large, massive commercial buildings with huge parking lots out in front. Uh, the first major shopping center was in Kansas City. In the 1920s, there was the first uh, commercial air conditioning. It was invented by a guy named Willis Carrier, 
and uh, it was first employed in larger buildings because the machines, as you can see here, were very quite large. And one of the first industries to have it was the um, new movie industry that was growing up. You don't really start seeing air conditioning in uh, common houses until a little bit later. You get window units in the 1950s and so forth. With the booming economies of the 20s and the expansion of car culture in America, you're getting a, a real real estate boom. They're building in areas that hadn't been built before. One of their cities that grew the most was Miami. And there in Miami, they started, they had a, a new style of construction called Art Deco. And it used uh, new materials that hadn't been invented before, but it had things like neon signs, and uh, they they employed you know more shiny colors they never employed before, and the things like uh, circular walls and windows on the on the corners of buildings, and those type of design elements. And if you go to Miami Beach today, you can you can still see it. Uh, there are other Art Deco areas. If, if you ever see Art Deco in other cities, it, that, that was probably built in the 1920s. Of course, when the De Great Depression hit in, uh, with the stock market crash in 1929 and throughout the 1930s, the economy was anything but booming. It, 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 unemployment reached 25%, and there wasn't a lot of government insurance to protect people, not a lot of social safety net. And so if you were renting and you couldn't pay your uh, rent, you were uh, evicted. And if you had a house with, the, with a mortgage and you couldn't pay your mortgage, the bank would foreclose on you. And uh, there was uh, nothing to protect you. And so people would be in a sense, the country had a lot of empty housing, empty apartment buildings, and a lot of homeless people. And what these home, homeless people would do is they would take their possessions and kind of go into public areas like the outskirts of cities or parks, and they would build little shanty towns, little shacks to, to live there. Now, the president at this time was the Republican Herbert Hoover, and people, of course, blamed him because they wanted the government to come in and, and help them. And so they sarcastically called these shanty towns of little shacks everywhere Hoovervilles. Well, in 1932, Herbert Hoover was voted out of office, and Franklin Roosevelt came in and had a massive uh, program of government activism, of course, famously known as the New Deal. And the New Deal involved a lot of things to help the poor, but one of the things that it had was the first public housing, with the idea that the government would help people find housing. Government funds would go to building housing for people. That That's not going to have a really big program in the New Deal, but it's going to, and it's going to be expanded later, as we'll see. But uh, the first public housing was really in the 1930s. One of the most famous architects was, was operating in the 1930s was Frank Lloyd Wright. And he, uh, he, act, he was, you know, continued. He started in the early 20th century and worked through the 1950s. He designed over a thousand buildings in a career uh, that spanned half a century, and he used the newest construction materials and re just rejected conventions of his day. He wanted to design homes to consider their place, not only uh, in the surroundings, but also what their function was. And as such, he was one of the leaders of the prairie style architecture, which of course, as I've said before, was designed to fit in, in, in the environment of the prairies. But Frank Lloyd Wright is looking to, you know, again, Put, I'm going to build, design a home, where is it going to be built and for what purpose? One of Frank Lloyd Wright's most famous designs was so-called Falling Waterhouse, shown here, which was designed in 1935. It looks so much modern, but you, know, you can see it was built into a stone waterfall, and, was, and the house was uh, built to resemble part of that stone waterfall. It was, it was using the natural environment in designing and incorporating the house around it. That, that, that's what Frank Lloyd Wright did well. So Frank Lloyd Wright was designing houses in 1935, but it was a depression, and most people, you know, they were not building a lot of houses. Everybody's broken. They weren't building a lot of houses in World War II. So when the soldiers came back from the World War II in 1945, there was a real housing shortage. And to address this issue, we're going to see the first planned suburban community. And this brings me to William J. Levitt's famous Levitt Town uh, on eastern Long Island outside New York City. So what Levitt did was uh, he would go out into the rural areas outside the city and just buy a huge chunk of land from a 
from a uh, farmer and then he would plan out streets and individual lots in that land and he would go to the local government and he would say look you're going to get a lot of revenue with these all these homes on these lots so the developer promised to chip in if the city would chip in things for like road construction and pipes and then Levitt also negotiated with home builders a common style home uh, that could be built very quickly and the developer the builder knew that he had so many homes to build he could buy it in bulk and so very quickly you could put up these houses on these pre-planned roads with pre-planned infrastructure and everything was done uh, planned in mass quantity and the houses could be cheap and uh, you know it just made Levitt a lot of money and this this idea of a planned community, of course, is, you know, th this is the case of most suburbs today, uh, growing suburbs anyway. But the first one was famous in the, 19, in the 1940s and late, late 40s and 50s. It was the Levittown, named for William J. Levitt. You know, as you can see here in Levittown, as I say, the houses were all the same. They were they were simple, and he'd have a tree in front of each house. And uh, you know, they, they if you're coming along later on and you look at this, you go, it looks bland, and it and it's not some place you'd want to live. But you kind of realize that these soldiers, had, you know, depression and war, having a home and having something bland and stable and and secure, that that was a really really attractive. Today, if you go to Levittown, of course, the houses have been uh, added on to and the trees have grown up and it doesn't look as homogenous as it did uh, initially when they built it. Popular in the 1950s was a so-called one-story ranch style homes and they were long and flat and uh, they were popular because they were one of the first homes with attached garages and they also had more open interiors. But, you know, you can now drive your car in to a garage and not even have to go outside. You know, we said in the 1920s they had garages that were separate, like the old carriage houses for horses. But here in the ranch houses, you could go into the garage and go into your house without ever getting, you know, without getting outside. Another interesting characteristic of ranch-style homes was they kind of had, a lot of them had outdoor patio space in the back. Uh, you tended before if you're going to have a porch or an area it was always be in the front well in the back you get more privacy and with the prosperity of the post-war era in the 1950s you know people would famously grill out in the suburbs and uh and so that was indicative of the ranch style home was indicative you see one it's probably from the 1950s or early 1960s by the late 50s another new style of uh architecture was developing the mid-century modern architecture mid-century included not only uh, home construction but I should note there's mid-century furniture and other design elements it included uh, you know again like the ranch house was one story and had clean simple lines but it had a lot more glass and metal and uh, didn't have a whole lot of decorative embellishment uh, more the windows uh, were, were larger they're they were popular through the 1960s and it was intended to look modern and, and simple. Here you can see some of the modern furniture, you know, the, the thin uh, supports on the couch or the, or the cabinet, the, the, the sort of bending chair. This is all indicative of, of modern architecture and modern furniture. Shifting gears somewhat, if you have homes in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of them had wood paneling in what were called dens. Uh, you had uh, a, like a formal living area, but a lot of homes had uh, were, were getting larger and they had a separate informal living area that they, they called dens. And these dens often had, uh, you know, wood paneling was popular during this period. Of course, all the 50s homes utilized all the modern 1950s domestic appliances. You could keep the house clean with the new vacuum uh, machine, and you could get a you you could get dishwashers, and you had uh, new new clothing dryers, and you know all the things that uh, the they had electrical outlets and a lot more in the kitchen because you could that that's where a lot more electrical appliances were used.
in larger institutional uh, type of uh, building, brutalist architecture was a style that emerged in the 1950s and kind of related to the modernist movement. Brutalist buildings were characterized by their massive, monolithic, and blocky appearance with a huge geometric style that was very rigid, you know, a lot, a lot of use of uh, poured concrete. Uh, you can still see these. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the brutalist architecture, but uh, it's you, you, you know it when you see it. Of course, with the, the economy growing and the government growing in the 50s and 60s, uh, you're going to have, I'm going to talk about the Great Society of the 60s, a lot of growth in Washington. And uh, the new federal buildings of the government were often built this time in brutalist style. Here you can see uh, a, a government building that's a, a brutalist style. So Lyndon Johnson was president, a Democratic president in the 1960s. And this was, as I say, the Great Society. It was a period in which uh, very, very... Uh, growth and, and faith in federal government, and they're trying to uh, stage a war on poverty and eradicate the poor. And what the a lot of the uh, Great Society did was try to do, get, do urban redevelopment. Now, with the car and the growth of the suburbs, many people had moved out of the inner city. And uh, they were living in suburbs and commuting in. And the people that were left in the city were often poor and the buildings became dilapidated. And so what a lot of the Great Society decided to do was to uh, go in and just basically bulldoze a lot of these older buildings and build new buildings. And uh, it was they had uh, model redevelopment cities. And they would build in big highways and more more skyscrapers and you can see a lot of 1960s architecture replacing the earlier Victorian dilapidated buildings but uh, you know this didn't happen everywhere but it happened in a lot of cities if you go into a city today and you see a lot of older buildings and it probably wasn't a lot of redevelopment now the 50s car culture out in the exploding suburbs what you're seeing is uh, the building of suburban malls and I, I mentioned that air conditioning was spreading. Well, here, you know, the, you're going to see a lot of the growth in the south, in the south and the west, where it's it's warmer and sunnier. And so you get air-conditioned malls. Uh, you feel like you're outdoors, and they have uh, big, wide hallways. And, and you could park your car in these massive parking lots that surround it and go in and walk around like a, uh, like an, a city street. And so... The, the malls of the 1950s and 60s uh, was a, a new de new architectural development. When you get to the 19, late 60s and 1970s, you're going to, again, see kind of some of these more modernist elements. One of the things that you see in a lot of late 60s and early 70s homes were sunken uh floors and so you'd you'd come into a house and there'd be a step down a step or two down into a living area. Popular in uh, many homes from the 1970s were uh, very thick shag carpets. Now, by the 70s and 80s, you're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, improvement in the suburban planned communities that Levitt had first started. You know, you're starting to see them evolve. You're seeing the use of cul-de-sacs where it keeps cars from speeding by. And you're also seeing homes designed around golf courses and the developments would have things like jogging trails and community centers and other amenities that the homeowners would pay for and, and have collectively together. So in the 50s and 60s and 70s, various stages of uh, car culture, suburban growth, cities just sprawl out. Now you see this more in, in areas, in the, as I say, in the south and the west, where there's cheaper land uh, in the more older northern cities, you, you don't quite see it as, as much, but it just goes on for, for miles and miles and miles, and indeed continues to this day. So if you're, if you're uh, living in the suburbs and <clears throat> you're commuting in, the commute can get long, uh, commuting into the central, central city, well, these central cities that hadn't been bulldozed by redevelopment have a lot of old dilapidated homes and uh, people to start trying, well, I don't want to do this long commute and 
you know, I kind of like an urban lifestyle of walking more. And so you're seeing a lot of young people in the 1980s and 1990s go back in and fix up these homes. And this is what we might call urban gentrification. And, uh, you know, the, it's, it's the case since the 1980s that urban centers are much more vibrant the, these old, uh, whether it's Federalist style homes or old Victorian homes or, uh, you know, whatever type of homes that have existed there, the all the Victorian home types, uh, people move in and fix them up and uh, walk more and the, the buildings are closer together. Well, uh, this is, you know, it has its downside because when they move in, tax rates go up and a lot of, it, you know, the poor people that have been living there don't have places to live and they're, they're forced out. But uh, gentrification has made uh, the cities popular. And uh, you see this in or pretty much every big city today. One of the characteristics is the popularity of loft apartments. Uh, where you take an old industrial building with high roofs and uh, and you turn them into living quarters and and that's supposedly hip type of living today for young people in cities. Now you're starting to see today uh, the you know the the popularity of more urban style of life where uh, it's not such car centric is becoming so is becoming so widespread that in these suburbs they're building these mixed use developments that have of a neo urban feel you'll have living apartments or homes above stores not to zoning them separately there won't be requirements for front yards and uh, you know that means people can walk around more and uh, these sort of neo urban mixed use developments are, are popular in many suburban areas today you know, as people build out homes, they I, th I do think they start cherishing the older homes more. Again, during the 1960s and the the Johnson Air Great Society Air redevelopment, they bulldozed all these homes. And with gentrification in the 80s and 90s, they preserved a lot of them. Well, people realize that certain homes have historic value, and you've seen oh, you going back to the middle of the 19th century, at least some effort to preserve historic homes, like George Washington's home, for example. But in the 20th century, you're seeing uh, much more effort to preserve homes that are of historic architecture or indicative of a certain time period and uh, historic zones in cities. Uh, you're seeing even this grow in uh, you know, new architecture schools and you can get history programs uh, with degrees and certificates in historic preservation today. In any event, this concludes the third video on the 20th century housing and indeed the last video on uh, the history of housing and uh, architecture in American history.